I'm Mike Daly, and I was one of the guys that uh, were involved in Lemmings. And we'll take you through basically how it came about and, and some of the um, things we did on the project. Um, I've been around for a long time. It's actually, I think, in August, there'll be 30 years in the games industry. So I've done quite a lot of bits and pieces, uh, starting from Commodore 64, going all the way through to um, high-end PC stuff and consoles. Uh, most recently, I was doing Game Maker studio work. Um, so I've kind of touched most of the bases. Um, Lemmings still has a kind of fond place in my heart. Lemmings obviously started at DME Design. Um, this was founded by a, a group of friends that all met in a computer club in Dundee uh, in the mid 80s. Um, that was our first office there, a tiny little pink office with two rooms. Uh, Gary Timmons uh, sitting in the window there. And that's where all the kind of uh, lemming stuff really originated. Here's us in our youth. I do still look like that. I'm just wearing a really good fat bodysuit just now. Uh, we've got Gary Timmons at the left, then Russell, Dave, myself, Steve Hammond at the bottom, then Brian Watson at the uh, bottom now with uh, Russell again. Um, as I said, we were in kind of two rooms, so we had a big room at the front for development and then a smaller room at the back for uh, office stuff that was taken over for dev later on. So Lemmings really came about because of an argument. Um, Dave was busy doing his second game, uh, Blood Money, and the artwork that he got by a guy called Tony Smith was beautiful. Some of the animations in it were just amazing for its time. Uh, one of the sprites that he gave us was uh, a walker, the same uh, two-legged walker that was in Star Wars, if you remember, um, the kind of ATAT, mini ATAT thing. And for its time, it was a really big sprite, beautifully animated. So Dave really got, kind of fell in love with this thing and thought that there could be a game in that. So he hired a guy called Scott Johnson to come in and basically take this guy and give him things to shoot, some backgrounds, and so on. So Scott started by drawing a man to shoot. And the guy was about 16 by 16 pixels in size. Um, but you can kind of see from this that you know he'd almost be up to the cockpit level. But if you remember the Star Wars uh, ATA, it was, you know, it was huge. The guys would barely come past the feet. So Scott and I had this extended discussion. And where I basically said he was wrong and decided to try and prove it. So I reckon you, you should try and get them as small as possible so that you got this real sense of scale when the walker decided to just shoot everybody. Um, I initially aimed for eight by eight pixels. Um, I thought that would be a good size to, to have it. So half the size he had. Um, I did have a, some inspiration for this. Um, I was doing Commodore 64 work at the time and it was a game called Beachhead 2. So you can see the guy there throwing the grenade. Um, he, he used to run out from behind the wall, throw a grenade, run off again. Um, Commodore 64 was really well known for having nice, smooth animation. And although this guy was much bigger than I actually remembered, um, he is actually almost 16 by 16 himself, um, the animation from it showed that even a, you know, a small blocky thing can get some really nice animation out of it. The other one was Oids. Um, Brian had lent me his Atari ST for one summer while he came to America to do his um, summer camp. Um, so aside from learning 68,000, I played a stack of games as well. Um, Oids was one of them. Um, Oids has this really cool um, little guy. He's about five pixels high. The animation sucked on it, but it was, it was a really small guy that you could run about and shoot. So I reckon somewhere in the middle, you'd probably get a good character uh, to, to work with. And that spawned this uh, image. Now, you can kind of see uh, the, the guy I did is this spiky-haired Mohican multicolored guy. Um, just to the right of the mouth, you can kind of see that uh, I'm walking there. So I drew him. He's a little bit bigger than a, I think he's about 10 pixels in all. And because I came from, it was coming, I'd been playing Oids. Um, I did this kind of burning down thing and then because we're kind of sadistic, we did it shooting them as well, uh, and then just drew a whole load of them. 
This was all done in Deluxe Paint. And DPaint has this really nice feature where you could pick up an animation and then just draw it across the screen. And it'll just do this lovely animating sequence. So I drew a grind on it, drew the gun um, over a couple of lunch times, and then showed the guys. Um, like most people, they kind of fell about laughing at it, thinking, this is great. Uh, Russell K immediately going, there's definitely a game in that somewhere. Um, one thing that did occur to us when we were doing this was that um, it's really nice to kill them and see them get, you know, <laughs> obliterated in different ways. Um, and it kind of harked back to the Roadrunner, Wile E. Coyote thing, where you can, you know, you can just think up huge numbers of ways to destroy them. Um, so I did that 10 ton weight, squishing them, which although it looks like it's getting a nice crunching of the bones as it goes down there, um, that was actually just because I didn't leave enough space to make it go down evenly, so it was a pure fluke. But it does really give a nice lemon crunching uh, down there. Um, Gary Timmins then came along and added the other three, the hands, the spinny rotor, and, and the mouth. Um, and just, I mean, there was endless ways you could go about killing these. And it, it was clear that if we could think of a way of putting them in a game, the whole thing would revolve around them dying somehow, because that was just the satisfaction of it all. Um, what he also did was he really fine-tuned the animation. Um, the guy I've got is very rigid. You can kind of see here, mine on the left, and then Gary's on the right. It's fundamentally the same guy, but he added the bouncing hair and the feet kind of roll really nicely. And you can kind of see that what he did, although the psychedelic colors again, is basically the lemming kind of coming to life. Um, and it's very close to the other one, but it just has that really soft bounce um, and nice animation that lemmings is known for. Now the colors of the lemmings was a technical limitation like most things were in those days. Um, Amiga and ST um, could pretty much pick any color they wanted, but we wanted to draw them in just four colors so that they were faster to draw because we wanted to have lots of these guys to kill. Um, on the PC, we had VGA, EGA, and CGA. Now, VGA, you could pick your colors as well. Um, CGA was so bad, you just didn't care. You would just go with whatever worked. So you were kind of left with EGA, and we kind of came up with the blue and green. So we did try flipping the dungarees and the hair. We had green dungarees and blue hair. Um, but it just felt this one was just a little bit more aesthetically pleasing. We did resurrect it for the two-player one later on. Um, now, Russell K did do the first ever demo of Lemmings. Um, the office actually only opened in August 1989. So you can see this is only a month or so after. Um, it was really in the first month that, we, that I did the animation. And then about a month later, Russell found time to actually go and try and knock something up. Um, he, th he had a bit of inspiration from this because he had been having an argument with Dave about missile following. In Blood Money, you could fire missiles out and, or rockets and bombs. Um, and initially, they wanted to fire rockets that followed the terrain. So Russell had thought of a way of kind of possibly doing this similar to what Salamander had. So he thought, maybe you can use this for the lemmings as well. So he um, created a little demo. There we go. Um, and he managed to get the 100 lemmings on there. Now, it, it was able to get a bit more, but the 100 was the kind of number, that gold number we were kind of aiming for. It gives you a real, you know, fills the screen with objects, which back then just was unheard of. Um, I think this was on an 8 megahertz one. Uh, oh, yeah, there you go, getting a thumbs up. So it was on an 8 megahertz machine, so it was a pretty slow machine, but he was still able to draw all 100 lemmings in the two frames. Lemmings actually ran in three, so it gave a bit more time for it. Now, one of the things to note about these when they're walking is the feet stick perfectly to the ground. Um, even today, you don't really get that. You know, characters tend to slide about. I think Gary made a really nice... Um, animation that, and just made sure that everything was absolutely bang on for walking. So you can see here with the, the lemmings down the, the one side, um, basically what happens is the feet would move one pixel to the left each time, because lemmings move one pixel at a time. And that gave it that kind of solidity to put it into the world, just absolutely perfect. So when they land on the ground, because it was usually flat, they were walking over, 
you could really see the feet just sticking and it put them right into the world. And he really did make just a, a great job of uh, doing that. Now the levels themselves were basically just gigantic bitmaps. There were 1600 by uh, 160, basically five Amiga screens wide. And although the special levels, the Menace, um, Shadow of the Beast uh, levels, were stored as bitmaps on disk, we obviously had severely limited disk space back then. So they were all done uh, effectively as little brushes. So each metal block would be a brush that you would place in the level, and you could go and delete it again, or you could edit it, or whatever. Um, it was all kind of modeled on uh, Deluxe Paint's editing. Um, the levels themselves, we kind of just came up with different ways of doing it. Um, and, you know, for the design of them, how we were going to approach it. We'll get to that in a second. The special levels had a, uh, an extra difficulty in that because of the color selection, I couldn't use any traps. I did all the, the, the different special levels. So I basically just had to work with a way of getting the lemming from start to stop using builders and, uh, and bashers. So it did complicate making those levels and making them any good. Um, they were never quite as good as, as all the other ones. Um, but it was nice to see these throughout the different stages. The art gallery one is interesting because that influenced how the game was going to look. It was the first level that really kind of became a picture rather than just a few blocks. And again, I'll talk about that in a second. These are some of the levels I did. Um, so when picking how to do a level and what level I was going to create, um, I either came up with a really nice idea for oh, I could fuck somebody with this, or they'll never guess this one. Um, or I would basically try and make a picture. So in the game, there was a little mini-map at the bottom that was basically a monocolored uh, outline of what the level was. And that was really for fast scrolling, because you just had the mouse, so touching the edge of the screen would take a long time to scroll to the other end of the five screens. So you could click on that and drag it. Um, but I like to kind of try and show little pictures in there if I could. So the top one's the Hunt the Nessie that I drew and then figured out a level to put across it. And then the second one was just the shipwreck that I did, but it's a similar thing, so that in the little mini-map, it looked like a little shipwreck. Um, I also really like doing, making the player do lots of things at the same time. So the fast food kitchen one there, the lemmings drop out two places at once and you have to get them both up to the, um, the exit um, in a reasonable amount of time, um, usually with ridiculously difficult uh, targets to, to achieve without losing any lemmings. Um, one of the other, my, my other favorite ones was um, It's Hero Time, which was basically, I thought of uh, getting a level where you would use one lemming and the other lemmings would all kind of just go their own way and you couldn't really stop them, they were just kind of marching on, but you had to get this other one to run ahead of them and fix things. Um, I took great satisfaction in the fact that when we sent it down to Psygnosis, we'd usually get a fax back with, this one took five minutes, this one took three minutes, and little comments, well, this wasn't too bad. Um, and that one came back with scribbles all over the page, cursing and swearing at it, and it took them about an hour and a half. So I was, I was quite pleased with that one. The bottom one, the 666, was my fault as well. Um, it didn't appear in very many ports of the game. It, it tended to get removed. I can't think why. Um, it actually started out because I was trying to get 55 of everything. So 55 bombers, 55 release rate, and so on. But I couldn't get the numbers to quite match up. Um, and I just discovered if I did 66, it all kind of worked. I happened to be doing the level in the fire and brimstone style. And you just immediately think, that's hell. So 666, that sounds like a good idea. Turns out it wasn't. Uh, <laughs> Now, when Gary did levels, he just did incredibly simplistic looking levels, but they were fiendishly difficult. Um, so you can see here the levels kind of extracted um, from the fluff around it. Now, that's usually what he gave to us to solve. It's just this very bare bones level. Um, they were incredibly difficult, um, but it was after seeing the the art gallery one that Dave kind of looked at them and went, yeah, nobody's going to pay for that, are they? So he, he ordered Gary to go and make the levels prettier. But you can see all he did was just put all these things around the base level that didn't interfere in any kind of way. Now, the levels when we were doing them, 
Um, by the time we got to the stage, we were all utter experts at making and solving levels. So we ended up basically trying to come up with levels that would beat ourselves. Um, and they'd be incredibly tough levels, but we'd still solve them in a couple of minutes without any problems at all. What that meant was we had you know, 20, 30 incredibly hard levels that nobody else would be able to solve. So the first thing um, Dave got Gary to do was to take all these levels and just make simpler versions of them. That only really uh, involved adding maybe a couple of skills. So if we gave you one builder and you had to get it right on the nail, then you might give them two builders and maybe a blocker and take the, the number you have to save just down a smidge. And that just simplified things um, an awful lot. So the levels could appear twice. He then got Gary to go and make basically introductionary levels, things like Just Dig, where all you had was diggers, and it was pretty straightforward to kind of figure out what you had to do. And it's probably one of the first games that really had the tutorial in it, although we didn't have big hands pointing and texting, do X, Y, and Z. It was all quite self-explanatory. But once Gary put these in, and he then set about making a nice difficulty curve, it's probably the thing that really made Lemmings the hit it was, because everybody could get into it at some point, We've heard from five-year-olds that got up to like level seven and really enjoyed it. Um, older folk that were able to get past the first stage and the entire families being able to play it. Pretty much because the difficulty level was such that everybody could play it. And that was going down to Gary, really just fine-tuning that level. Oops. Do that again. So, Lemmings Editor. I did manage to resurrect my... 20 or 30 year old disc. Um, I don't think it'll work anymore, but I've got some video, so hey ho. Now, what made this unique, uh, particularly for the time, was the Lemmings editor was built right into the game. And for the games we'd done up to this point, we had a separate level editor. You design it, you save it off, you copy it over to the game, you'd run it, you go, that didn't work, and you go back again. This obviously doesn't work for Lemmings because you have to fine tune to pixels. So you would just hit escape in this, you go into the editor, you make your change, hit escape again, and you get back into the game. And this let you just fine tune everything just that little bit to make it just a perfect level. So as you can see there, it's holding a kind of um, brush that I could put down and paste in. Um, and that's kind of where deep paint is. You pick up a, an area in deep paint or deluxe paint, and then you could just draw with it. And we kind of modeled it on that. This is the hero time one that I was talking about before. You just get that march of them. And again, you just go in and out. This level would have been a nightmare to make if I couldn't just hop in and out the level. Now, you've got 512 of these brushes that you could put down anywhere in the level. Um, but it did mean that if you wanted to delete one that was in the middle of the level, you had to go into a special edit mode and then just hit enter to go through every single block till you got to the one you wanted, press delete, and then carry on again. Um, but we thought it was still pretty good because Deep Ink couldn't do that. We were just used to bitmaps, basically. Um, so here I'm kind of putting down blocks very wobbly. Um, turns out that you really do need mice mats for uh, ball mice, and I don't have one anymore. <laughs> Um, so, but you can see I put down the blocks and I can go and delete them again if I decide that's not what I want. Um, the actual editing of it, there's, there's different ways you can put down a block. You can either just paint it down on top of everything else, or you can kind of go into a behind mode so the block will draw behind things, or you can take it to, so it's a mask and you can cut areas away. The lemmings themselves just walk on whatever is in the level. You'll notice it in, in Lemmings 1, it's, it's just a plain background. There's nothing for them to walk over. So any place where there's a pixel, that's what they walk on. So here you can see I'm going to take, get a brush, and then I can put it behind the background, and I could draw it in there if I wanted. Or I can make it a, a mask, and then that becomes an area I can, I can cut away. And then when you play, it just becomes a big bitmap again, and then the lemmings just walk over that. So making a level was really just about trying to get this big bitmap that they can walk over. That was a level that wasn't used, because it was crap. So, um, but you can see there as well the little green mask that I, I like to draw pictures in. That was quite good fun. 
Objects as well could go inside the actual background that we use for the arrows. Um, but again, that was just on any pixel that happened to be there. So here again, you can see going through, picking some kind of uh, brush, and then I can use that to take away the background. And then when the lemmings start, they can just follow through and walk through the newly created bitmap. Now, depending on what you want, you might want it to be smoother, you might want it to be hard drop. Again, you just get the brushes, and then you can just scribble in whatever you wanted on these things. There you can see the arrows obviously come through because it's got more pixels to go on. It just uses the background as a mask to draw into. And then that just walks through. So you can see being able to go in and out of the level just you know, at random to fine tune that little bit is incredibly important to Lemmings because that's where you really just adjust things just to be uh, just right. So I will talk about objects and the collision because I couldn't find the keys in the editor. Uh, we didn't have manuals back then, so I have no idea what the keys were. Um, because it was just a big bitmap, the actual collision for things like metal um, were kind of fudged in. Basically what you do is go in and mark rectangular areas um, and say this is solid. So you can see here there's several of these over the top of things. Um, it doesn't discriminate between metal or anything else. So you can see as well the, the, at the far right it goes over some of the, the ground. That's marked as solid as well. But it's also pretty crap. Um, if it fits perfectly, so when a lemming walks, the collision is just under his feet, so you'd be one pixel into the ground. So as he walked over the metal, if you did a bomber and tried to explode, it'd look at that pixel and go, oh, I'm in, I'm in solid, I won't actually take any background away. And that all was good with the world. But if you happen to have a builder and built a few pixels above the collision and then did a bomber, it'd be checking the collision and going, no, that's not right. And it would just take big chunks out the metal. It's probably the, the biggest failing in the, the uh, original Lemmings mechanic. But we just kind of designed around that. Occasionally, if we thought a player could cheat and get through, you'll see here there's a little border sometimes that we just extend it just to make sure they can't kind of cheat their way around it, if it really matters. And you could put down lots of these rectangles wherever you needed. The objects themselves, you got 32 objects. Um, you obviously had to have your entry and exit points. So here I've got four entry points and the exit. Again, I, I love to make players do lots of things at once because it drove them mad. Um, the rest of it you tended to use either for traps um, that you would hide away sometimes underneath other things so they just didn't see them, or you'd use it for fluff. Water is used just for decoration all over the place. Um, it was a really nice animation. You could just fill the level with it to give it a bit of movement. So the front end was going to be very different. Um, Dave initially wanted to basically have the front end just covered in lemmings and have messages come up by them, having them hold up little cards. So he got me to do a prototype and I went and drew a stack of lemmings um, and then covered the screen, so it was 320-200 screen, um, in these lemmings. Um, and aside from looking really cool, it was totally bizarre. Um, you just couldn't follow what was going on. So that was dropped, which is a shame, because you can kind of see the Lemmings a nice character. You can literally do anything with it, and it just feels kind of right. Um, but it, just, it was just far too confusing. So we went with a more traditional uh, front end, which is a bit of a shame. Explosion. Now, I suspect, like us, when you first saw this, you thought it was quite funny. Um, no more so than Brian, who did fall off his chair laughing, as shown in this dramatic <laughs> reconstruction. Uh, and aside from laughing at Brian, which is always a good thing to do, um, it, it solved a number of things. You know, the level had to be finished somehow. If you got stuck in a level, you had to abort it. And it goes back to the initial thing of, we really like killing these guys. So a way of killing them all off is a good thing. Um, the actual pixel explosion came because Dave loved Defender. So he really decided that I want that explosion. Um, I've been asked several times whether it's a particle system or a big sprite. Um, it's basically a point cloud animation. So it's basically a list of 
positions that are offset from an origin and then just frames of it. And it was drawn by Gary to make it look pretty. But, I mean, it was just super satisfying just nuking them all the time. Um, sometimes even when you were going to finish the level, you didn't care. You just had to do it. Now, I do want to just comment on the, the graphics. Um, these days, obviously, when you do graphics and you port it to another system, they're all 16-bit, 32-bit graphics. They just kind of go across. You might have to resize them a bit, but that's about it. Back in the day, you didn't have the luxury. You literally had to redraw everything. So you can see the different variety there, different screen sizes, different color depths, different colors. The second column ends the PC one, so you've got VGA, EGA, and CGA. Steve Hammond did all those. And you can see what I mean by CG, it's just awful. You know, the color selection just, you just kind of make best. Um, the EG one is luminous and crap. Um, so really you need that, you know, Amiga VG kind of uh, look. Some of the, the black and white ones, I've got massive respect for them. Because if you think about it, particularly in the game, you need the shading to give some definition. But in Spectrum and the Game Boy one, you'll need to kind of do dithering to see, you know, that's a shadow and so on. But at the same time, you've got to walk over this, which meant that you'll be walking over a mask that has no pixels in it. So it kind of differs from the main game in that there could be something that looks totally empty, but your lemon's going to turn around in. Um, and that was just a limitation of the system. You couldn't make everything just solid white or not. Um, it just looked awful. Um, some of the other ones, uh, the uh, Atari Lynx one was a tiny little screen. We ended up having to do the um, panel again, and it just filled the screen because we didn't have the space for it. Um, and the Sega versions and the um, Nintendo versions, and specifically the Game Boy one, um, we had huge respect for trying to get that five screen bitmap into that limited memory. It was incredibly well done. Two player lemmings. So, this kind of came about because we love playing the two-player games. Um, specifically, we used to play Populous and Stunt Car Racer. Uh, because we had two rooms separated by a hallway, we'd put an Amiga in each room, and then a null modem cable would run between them. Um, and then Dave would thrash the life out of us in whatever game he chose. Um, but the two-player game, you know, it was, it was something that was just quite new for Amigas at the time. So Dave got me to basically get an all-modem cable, connect up, and then write a, a driver for controlling a mouse on a different screen, um, which I did, and I was able to move my mouse on my Amiga, and it moved on his. Um, but he kind of decided at the end that, you know, not everybody can cart their Amiga and TV around to their pals. So he went with the kind of more that split screen thing. The big bit down the middle is just to hide the blip, because you couldn't be bothered doing it properly. Um, You'll see the uh, green and blue-haired lemmings kind of come back again for the two-player one. It's interesting, though, because even though you're right next to it and you can see what the other player's doing, you never actually paid much attention to what they were doing. You would always be concentrating on your, your pixel-perfect perfect clicking for your lemming and then wonder why there's screaming going on in the corner because all your lemmings are dying. And it's because the other bugger sent a lemming over and dug straight down past your exit and you didn't notice. So it was really, it was a really good two-player game. And it's one that's, I'm kind of sad that's never really been uh, brought forward. Um, it did appear on the Amiga and ST versions, but the PC one couldn't do it. Back in those days, you were all, it was all mouse drivers, and they just didn't allow you to have two mice plugged in at the same time. So it just couldn't do it. Um, I was told a story as well that the um, Data East guy that commissioned the arcade version of Lemmings, which didn't actually come out, but they did commission it, um, wouldn't finish a meeting without challenging you to a two-player game. Yeah. So that was the end screen of Lemmings. Um, we did start a little revolution back then. There, there was a few Amiga games came out with all the devs around it. Um, and I do think it's quite nice to see, because dev, the actual team tends to get hidden a bit these days, you know, you'll tend to get the designer or the producer being the front man to it. So I think being able to put faces to people, I think is quite nice. No matter what, how thick the design document is, every developer, be it artist or programmer, has put their own little bit in it to make the game better. Um, and I think it's, it, it'd be nice to see more of them. This screen came about, 
really donated. <laughs> this screen came about because we were looking for an ending, and the endings we'd done before were rubbish. So I'd been drawing the lemming in the middle from some of the Psygnosis PR material that we got. And the stuff that goes to shops, we got a stack of free stuff. So I'd just been doodling in deep paint. I'd been doing lots of cartoon art. Um, and Dave came up with the idea of, you know, we could just hover around them there and, and get it. We had a, an Amiga Gen lock at the time. So we all just kind of posed in funny poses. And then Gary Timmons went and collated it all together. Um, interestingly, this has got my only initial in the game, because Dave didn't put my name in the game. Not that I'm bitter or anything. Uh, but yeah, there's a wee MD at the bottom. I don't know if you can see it there. So that's my only claim of fame in there. Um, but it was, it was a nice end screen. And I think we all cheered as well at the end of it, which was slightly pathetic. So Lemmings 2. Now, this will be mainly uh, Super Nintendo, but we'll go through a wee bit. One of the big things in Lemmings 2 was obviously the addition of the skills. Um, there were way too many skills added. The original Lemmings 1 had a really nice set of skills, and a few of the new ones in Lemmings 2 were pretty good. The Ballooner, the uh, Superman, and the Archer. Even though the Archer code was awful, um, it was a really nice skill to have. Some of the other ones, like the Pole Vaulter, um, and the Magnum Booter was really nice, but semi-pointless, really. Uh, hand glider and stuff were just silly. Um, so there was way too many. I think you could have doubled the skills that we had before and still maintained a really nice kind of balance with it. But David suddenly, David thought that, you know, we had just hardly any skills. Let's put loads and loads into it. Um, in the end, we ended up having to go back through levels and adding skills that just weren't used in any of the levels because there were so many of them. Now, the Lemmings editor for Lemmings 2, we did actually have a manual written by Steve Hammond um, with his usual flair. Uh, and these are taken from the manual because I forgot all about these, so it was quite handy. Um, again, one of the big additions, I think, that really added to the game was having vertical levels. Um, in Lemmings 1, it was obviously just horizontal, but being able to have that kind of building up vertical or square I think was a big addition and, and helped a lot. Um, these were basically the sizes that fit in exactly the same memory pool. Uh, I think we had about a K and a half for the, the, the tile map because we moved from bitmaps to tile maps. And these different orientations used exactly the same amount of memory. So we could just change the orientation without having anything fancy. Lemmings 2 had a a big change in technology because we did know, notice, specifically from the Game Boy version and the Mega Drive and SNES, that they were having to try and fight against this big bitmap system. Um, they just didn't have the memory for it. So we made a conscious choice to basically do tile maps, even on machines like the Amiga and ST and, and PC, so that the console versions would have a much easier time of it. Since I was writing the SNES version, I was really thankful for that, because it would have been a nightmare. I did even find the Lemmings 2 editor. Having never used this before, I have no idea what I'm doing in it. So it's basically tile maps, so it's 16 by 8 tiles. And unlike Lemmings 1, you could actually put tiles into the background to, to be a picture as well. Um, they just didn't go towards the mask um, for the collision. We also had that spare page idea, which um, we've used since, because Dave didn't want designers spending all their time trying to glue together these tiny little blocks. So we ended up having them a, a sheet that had all the blocks glued together for us, and you just click on it and paste it in. And it made uh, tile design um, incredibly rapid. You see, they just go and click, and you pick it up. You also notice this one's been put in behind mode. So that means Lemmings will just walk in front of it and ignore it. And again, like Lemmings 1, this is built directly into the game for exactly the same reason. You need that fast turnaround in a game like this. The actual tile stuff was done so that you'd have a certain number of tiles available a chunk of them would be pre-allocated like this that you couldn't modify. So when you started building, 
it would basically copy that tile into a new unique tile just for that slot and then build through it or take away the ground and make that area a little bit map in its own right. Now, the Amiga ST and PC had oodles of memory for this stuff, so they can kind of do it infinitely. The SNES version didn't. It had a severely restricted amount of memory. So the levels had to be redesigned for the SNES one so that you didn't have the kind of infinite destructibility or building of the level. So this is the character map um, stuff that I was talking about. So it was a 32-bit character map uh, with the character number at the bottom. Now, there's two bits in here that are interesting. One is the, the behind mode. So basically, when you were drawing the tile, that would mean don't do any collision with that, and you could walk in front of it. And that meant you could get a much nicer picture than Lemmings 1 with the, the plain back, black background. The other one is the no modify. Now, you remember from Lemmings 1, we had these rectangular things that were crap. So what this meant was each tile that you put down, you could flag as you, you will not destroy it, you will not modify it. And that gave us perfect metal detection for a change. So when it came to reallocate that tile and copy it and modify it, we just look at that bit and go, no, nah, we're not going to do that. And that meant we got perfect metal so we could destroy stuff around it, but not modify these tiles. There's other things in here to do with clicking on things like the um, cannons there, so there's offsets and collisions and stuff like that in there as well. Now, this is from the SNES one. Um, that was the memory map that I had. Um, and I was a little bit tight on memory on the VRAM. Um, the biggest problem with the SNES version was that even though it has lots of hardware, I couldn't use hardly any of it. Uh, SNES is really just, you could have like 16 sprites in a line. When you've got, I could only do 80, but when you've got 80 lemmings in a row, clearly hardware sprites aren't going to cut it. So I did end up having to draw all the lemmings in software. So this was on a 3.5 megahertz 65816. So it was a 16-bit 6502. Now, the SNES did, however, have a four-color screen. So you can see at the bottom, it's got the bit planes laid out. But the four-color screen is just straight columns. And what that meant was I could have my lemmings graphics and then just paste them vertically and then draw them in columns. And it made it very fast to draw. I also had other tricks like... 65816, you could reposition zero page for those of you who know what a 6502 thing is. Um, and I could put that towards the base of the graphic to shave off a few extra cycles and get it in. Because this screen was being transferred every game cycle, I could also use it for explosions, the filler, um, and anything else I wanted to kind of regenerate every frame. So it was super useful for that. I did also have to put in a parallax background just to make it a bit prettier, because Dave seemed to think that console games should look nicer. Um, but the Amiga game apparently could just look as bad as he wanted it to. But hey. Um, he also didn't like the fact that it didn't smooth scroll. So the Amiga and PC versions were all like the Lemmings, the original Lemmings one. It was quite a juddery scroll. Um, but he kind of demanded I went and smooth scrolled everything. So I came up with a system to kind of interrupt scroll it and, and get it working. Um, and then managed to persuade them to go and put it into the Amiga versions as well. So at least they were pretty to, to look at. Um, I did also have some of the sprites as uh, skills. So any skill that was, you weren't going to get too many in a row. So, you know, Poe Volter, Magno Booter, Superman, they were all sprites that I could draw. Anything where you got, you know, a dancer or a blocker or fallers, where you could have loads of them, they all had to be drawn in software um, very quickly. Uh, the front end screen in Lamy 2 on the SNES has a few hidden things. Um, the, probably the one that most people found was the little hole in the tree. That was a music test. You click that and it just cycled the music. Uh, less likely to find was if you clicked all the windows and doors, you got a cheat mode. I have no idea what the cheat mode actually does. It just comes up cheat mode. I'd have to go back and try and figure it out. Uh, you click the dot at the top, you got what I called visual sound effects. Um, I actually had quite a lot of time at the end of Lemmings to mess about. Um, Psygnosis took quite a lot of time to get things like maker codes and cartridge stuff all kind of organized. So I ended up playing for a while, a good while. Uh, and so to entertain myself, I put hidden Easter eggs in. So visual sound effects is when a lemming flies through the screen and he kind of yells going across or he hits the guy and goes oof, you get the little text coming above his head as he does it. Now. There is a single pixel on that screen with that end sequence points just under the two, 
that if you click it, you will get straight to the end sequence. Um, it was done as a test, then I thought, sod it, just leave it in. Nobody, nobody will find it. So, um, but it's super handy. If you just want to go and see the end sequence, you can just find that little pixel, click it, you get straight there. So there's the visual sound effects in Lemmings 2. You can see this is the SNES one. It's got that parallax background. Um, you also notice I have snow. Um, again, I was really bored. So um, I put snow in. I did start by having snow land on the ground. I had all these routines for the filler for doing plot a pixel in the level. So I thought, have snow come down, rest on the ground. That'll be really nice. Didn't occur to me at the time that Actually, if you just wait long enough, that saves you having to do a builder because the snow just builds up and you can just walk up. Or if you'd spent ages digging through something, it's now just going to fill that area in. So I ended up having to take it out and it was just decorative in front of stuff. You'll also notice that kind of column starting to appear. Um, my random number generator was crap. And if you left it long enough, you would just get this single column kind of wobbling down. Uh, fortunately, most of the levels, in fact, all the levels, didn't run that long. It was usually I went out for lunch, came back, and I just have this vertical column going. Um, but you did occasionally get these uh, columns appear towards the end of a level. Um, but pfft, there you go. Um, the SNES version also gave me the hardest bug I've ever had. Um, it took me three months to track down. Basically, a lemming would be walking along the ground, and then every now and again, he would just fall halfway through the ground and then get stuck. Um, I could not figure out for the life of me what it is. If we go through the code, just reading it, dry running it, everything. I eventually tracked it down to the, the Super Nintendo has a hardware multiply. It's actually got two hardware multiplies. One of them is tied to the uh, mode seven stuff and it's actually instant. You put it in, you get the result back straight away. There was another one where you put it in and then 16 cycles would pass, then you get the answer. So naturally, you use the one that's instant. Turns out, though, as it crossed the vertical blank, that would reset that register. It wasn't in any documentation. Nintendo didn't even know about it. Um, and it only happened between two 6502 instructions. So when I wrote the final value and read it out, in between these, if there was a vertical blank interrupt happen, I would get the wrong answer. So just occasionally, a line would fall through the ground. It's a nightmare. So I ended up swapping to the other multiply, taking the speed hit, but finally figuring it out. It's horrible. Hardware bugs are just the hardest to find. Another thing I did. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, I did mention I was bored, didn't I? Yeah. So I borrowed the super scope from Russell Kay's company because um, it just came up with this wacky idea. And I thought, you know, why not? So if you plug a super scope into the second port, you can aim and shoot the lemmings just for the hell of it. Um, they do just blow up. There's no real point to it. But it's so satisfying. Um, now, the uh, Ardman guys were going to a conference, and they wanted to do this thing on hidden Easter eggs that nobody had found. So they got in touch, and they asked me about it. And I went, yeah, this one's never been found. So I told them about it. They did this really nice video. Uh, you can go and see it on YouTube. It's really funny. And they kind of get it and they just shoot and they're chuckling away as well. It's, it's highly satisfying. So Lemmings 3, I just want to mention one thing and then we will never speak of it again. <laughs> so the biggest problem with Lemmings 3 is the character size. Now you can see there as they walk, they've got the feet going specific blocks and so on. And that meant whenever you selected something, it had to be on this, you know, a, a specific boundary for them to do things. That kind of got rid of that kind of instant lemming click, do something. Now, the whole reason for this was we actually got contacted by the children's television workshop who thought, you know, lemmings, there's a lot of them. We could probably count them on TV. That'd be great. Um, but they were just too small. So Dave thought, oh, yeah, Sesame Street. Oh, we want a bit of that. So started doing the game, made the lemmings bigger, kind of lost a lot of the charm with it. Um, and put in lots of restrictions and just kind of spoiled some of it a bit. And then Sesame Street didn't use it. So, um, but I mean, it, it's the, the uh, third one, I think, certainly just broke some of the real niceties of Lemmings. The tiny wee characters and stuff, I think, are really what make it. Now, in Dundee, um, they have taken Lemmings to heart. And 
just the games culture in, the, uh, in general. So we actually have a spot in the museum, which is the weirdest thing ever, seeing your own stuff in a museum and you're not dead yet. Uh, it's very strange. And there's also this art being done as public artwork where they've got lemmings climbing up walls just up from the original office, which is, again, the coolest thing in the world. Uh, it's very cool. So the, the stuff in the museum was donated by a few folk from DMA. Um, I put the big lemming in. There's actually a DMA design uh, sign there that I pinched on the last day from one of the offices, um, even though Dave didn't like that because he couldn't get post put there anymore. So. Um, but it's, it's very cool. So if you've got Dundee, these things are around there. It, it's very nice. And that's it. There's our souls fogies now. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> if anybody's still awake and wants to ask anything, I, I can. Otherwise, you can make a break for it. No? Oh, so close. Ed, thanks. Really good game. Um, <laughs> worms always felt like a spiritual successor to Lemmings. <clears throat> yeah, yeah. Worms. We, we don't speak of worms. No. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, I mean, it was just the small characters. There was a few games that came out. You got humans as well that kind of came out at the same time. Um, worms, we felt, borrowed a few things from us, shall we say. Um, they've obviously gone on. It's been a shame that Sony's kind of sat on the, the IP for so long. Um, so, yeah, meh. <laughs> Great talk, by the way. That was really interesting. Um, so you mentioned you made um, introductory le levels for the first Lemmings. We taught the different skills. Yeah. Uh, how did you arrive at the conclusion that that was something the game actually needed? I mean, the, the actual levels themselves, when you start with the skills, um, particularly because it was a, it was a new genre, really, um, we always felt that it was just, you know, you want that slow entry point and just so people can have a play with it. Um, Lemmings 2, we had the practice mode where you could just go and fiddle. Um, but the original Lemmings didn't really have that. So it was really just the best way of letting people play with things and see what the outcome of them were going to be, I think. Okay, thanks. I just want to thank you for making my middle school teacher's head explode <laughs> when she saw that 1666 level. It was wonderful. Thank you. The, the deep south. The south down here really didn't like that. There was a big uproar. It was quite amusing. Yes. I loved it to death. Uh, oh, he's got a notepad. What's <laughs> <laughs> Taking notes. Uh, was there uh, a process behind coming up with the name? Uh, like, were other names considered uh, for but, Lemmings? Lemming, no, actually, or it was, was again, immediate? Russell Kay, pretty much when he saw the original animation, he just went, they're like little Lemmings. And that was it. It just mm -hmm. stuck. So, and it, it fits it perfectly for it, so. Good night. Um, just wanted to, uh, you to just talk about like what it might have felt like during the sort of Lemmings mania of when it sort of came out. Uh, I know like I've been I've found some stuff recently where there was like a no couple of novels uh, at the time, which is interesting, and a few old articles about there's a movie that might be made and all this sort of oh, stuff. Yeah. Um, I mean, when we were <laughs> making the game, you have no idea. Yeah. It's the same for any any game being made. You've, you have not a clue if it's going to do well. Um, the same was true, you know, did Lemmings, then later did GTA, and it's just. You had no idea. You do the game that you think is fun. Mm. When it came out and it kind of exploded, because we were getting 100% reviews at some sometimes, was just insane. Um, you know, you're just kind of strutting about, going, "This is cool." Um, and then you got get things like in the Lemmings 2, they did there was that song that got done as well, mm. in a rap song. It's just the bizarrest <laughs> thing. Um, but I love seeing. I mean, even at expos now, you'll get folk. You know, several folk dressed as Lemmings just walking around expos and stuff, and it's brilliant. Some of the fan art and stuff that gets done is amazing. So we just love it. <laughs> awesome. Also, just um, did you see at the time, like with things like Oh No More Lemmings and Christmas Lemmings and all that sort of stuff, did that see like a big jump again, like, you know, when those came out like a bit later? Well, after? Christmas Lemmings was done as a demo disc. Mm. Um, we were just, because the original one came out at the start of the year, we wanted another one just to remind folk it was kind of there. So Gary Timmons had done the, the Lemmings with the little Christmas suits on, and they were just really cool. We thought we should do a demo with that. So I did some of the animations, you know, the, the bouncy snowman and stuff. And then we just did a, a demo disc. And then Psygnosis being the money people that they are, went, ooh, new franchise. And did holiday lemmings out of it. So, I mean, we were just kind of riding 
the wave and, and enjoying it, really. Cool. Awesome. <clears throat> um, I'm Eli, and uh, thank you for animating that snowman. It was my favorite snowman <laughs> as a kid. I, I did get complaints that it didn't kill you. But we, because it was, it was a, a Christmas thing, we, we wanted to be nice. Turns out that was the wrong thing to do. Yeah. Um, this is kind of a random question, but um, when it kind of became general knowledge that uh, lemmings don't actually jump off cliffs to kill themselves, <laughs> and it was an, exposed as an urban legend, um, did you reflect on the name at all? No, I didn't give a shit. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, I was wondering if you could speak a little bit about the sound effects you chose for Lemmings, because blowing them up was satisfying, but the little sound they made before they blew up was equally as satisfying. So the, the sound was interesting, because we did start with um, 60 theme tunes from movies, but that was just the point where all the movie studios were getting interested in games because they were starting to make money, and we thought it would be a bad idea to put them in and then get sued by them. So we did the random uh, tunes just made up, and then the sound effects was actually the, um, Scott Johnson who did the background art. It was actually his mother that did all the sound effects for the, the lemmings. <laughs> I think they were sped up a little bit. Yeah, getting nods. So they were sped up a little bit, but she did all the sound effects for that. Um, and they just fit perfectly. Awesome, thanks. Uh, in the original lemmings, I think when you made a lemming a climber and a floater, they become like an athlete. Yeah. And I was just wondering, that's because it had two skills. Just so, because when you hovered the cursor over, it, got, it told you what it was. He's a builder. He's a walker. Right. So you needed that differentiation to go. You've got both of those skills without trying to fill that whole space because it was it was limited down there. So it was just yeah, became an athlete. That basically. makes a lot of sense. I think we're done. Thank you very much.